This video is part two in a series on secondary progressive MS. We're going to talk about how we treat the disease. Don't turn away because that starts right now. This video is part two in a two part series. If you haven't seen the first half of this series, check out this link right there. Definitely click it right now, watch that video, and then jump back over here. In the last video, we really delved deep, helping you better understand progression in general and how we define secondary progressive MS. This video is gonna get deep into how we treat and beat secondary progressive MS. So let's jump in. I wanna spend some time talking to you both about disease modifying therapies for SPMS and symptomatic therapies for SPMS. And I wanna start off by dispelling some rumors. It is a fallacy that we can't impact MS in a progressive state. That's simply not true. I remember hearing from many, many patients, please don't tell me I have SPMS because then no drugs will work. That's not true, guys. Particularly when you look at the newer, highly effective medicines, we know that we can delay the onset of secondary progressive MS by taking them. We can push out the time that someone develops SPMS. I hypothesize that if we use the most potent medicines as early as possible, we might push that out indefinitely. We also know that people with secondary progressive MS that take medicines slow the progression that they experience. There was a very bothersome study done recently where they took a bunch of people with relapsing MS that had not had an attack in over five years, they were all on a therapy, and they were all over 55. And in this experiment, half of them went off drug and half of them stayed on their drug. Now what they found over the next two years really bothered me. In the pool of people that, that were taken off drug, one third of them went on to progress in their disability. I believe this is evidence that removing a disease-modifying therapy in a stable progressive patient is a really bad idea because I think they progressed because we took away their therapy. Another thing that we really must point out is that people with secondary progressive MS have a relapsing form of MS. They've had relapses and they're still at risk of having relapses. They're also still at risk of having new spots on their MRI. Now statistically, someone is less likely to have a new attack or a new spot in their 60s and 70s as compared to their 20s and 30s. But the likelihood that that human bounces back from an attack is much, much lower. So another reason to keep on keeping on with disease modifying therapy is that even though they're less likely to have an attack, the attacks tend to be more severe and leave permanent deficits. And so we still want that so-called insurance policy against that taking a disease-modifying therapy. At the end of the day, our goal is to allow the brain to age naturally. And I feel very strongly that the best way to do that is to apply the most effective DMT as early as possible. I do not believe that stopping disease-modifying therapies at a given chronologic age or when someone reaches a definition of SPMS makes any sense whatsoever. And I would not encourage that. Also, a special note about non-ambulatory patients. Almost nothing makes me more upset than when someone tells me, well, my doctor wanted to stop my drug because now I'm in a wheelchair. And that doesn't make any sense. You've lost the function of your legs, but you still have the function of your arms, which now work as your arms and your legs because they help you in your wheelchair. Plus, you can still speak and swallow and see and think. And those are all functions controlled by the brain and spinal cord they're still at risk. You still have a lot to lose. And I most certainly want to, wouldn't want to remove something keeping you in play. Non-ambulatory patients are still patients. They're still humans and they deserve treatment. And just because they happen to be in a wheelchair and we're not going to be able to give them their legs back doesn't mean it's any less important or less relevant. The future of disease modifying therapy is really going to require, in my opinion, three different drugs. Anti-inflammatories, which is basically all the DMTs we have right now. They're all different flavors of anti-inflammation. We also need to add to that a remyelinating agent, something to put myelin back on the axons. This would be the equivalent in the leaking pool of pouring water into the pool. Lastly, we need a neuroprotective agent. In the leaky pool model, this would be plugging the leak. 
And it's my opinion that with an anti-inflammatory, a remyelinating, and a neuroprotective agent, those are the three key pharmacologic components that we will need to beat this disease. Much to my chagrin in 2019, all we have is anti-inflammation. Those other two are in research, and we're very hopeful we'll see them enter the armamentarium over the next several years. One last comment about treatment. We are on the cusp of adopting a neurofilament light chain, which is a blood biomarker, which I think will revolutionize how we treat MS. Neurofilament light chain can go up before an attack occurs, and it goes up with progression. And so I think it opens a door for us to better monitor MS, both relapsing and progressive MS, and to know when we intervene. Neurofilament light chain also drops or normalizes when you start a therapy. And it's not available commercially just yet, but I really think in the next few years it will be. If you'd like to learn more about Neurofilm at Light Chain, I'll make sure to include a link down in the description below to a video on the channel that talks more about it. I now shift our attention to treating symptoms. Treating a symptom is all about improving the quality of one's life. I'll use my favorite example, erectile function. So some men with multiple sclerosis develop erectile dysfunction. Not all, but some do. And if a guy with MS has erectile dysfunction and he doesn't like it, I give him a little blue after dinner mint, a Viagra. And this doesn't slow down MS, it doesn't speed up MS, it just makes Friday night awesome. That's treating a symptom that bothers him. But if there's a gentleman with MS who has erectile dysfunction and doesn't care, we don't give him Viagra because it's not gonna improve his quality of life. If we slow down your MS, but we don't work on the quality of your life, we're not doing the best job we could. Our goal really is to make you the most awesome version of you possible. And we accomplish that by slowing the disease down and by improving your quality of life. And this is an important and sometimes overlooked aspect of care for people with secondary progressive MS. Without going into deep depth, I wanna review some of the key symptoms that we need to be thinking about. Now we need to think about them with all people with MS. I just think it's particularly relevant as we talk about SPMS. The first one is what I call the trifecta of symptoms. Fatigue, depression, and cognitive impairment or cog fog. Those three symptoms are tied together with a bow. And if one is impacted, the others follow. If one gets worse, the other two gets worse. If one gets better, the other two get better. I'll link a description I'll link a video I did on this exact topic down in the description below so you can watch that video. But I feel that these are things that people with SPMS are at risk to experience, depression, fatigue, difficulty with thinking and memory, and we need to be tackling them at every single visit. Another trifecta are the down there's. I'm talking about bowel, bladder, and sexual function. These are invisible symptoms which can absolutely erode an individual's quality of life. And at every single clinic visit, we need to be thinking about bowel, bladder, and sexual function. I'll include a link to a playlist on this exact topic down in the description in case you'd like to learn more about it. I also think it's very germane to think about walking. And there are a lot of things that can impact walking. And so if we're gonna do the best job possible as it relates to symptoms, we need to be looking into things that can make you not walk well or could make you fall weakness, but in addition, spasticity of limbs, in coordination of the limbs, motor fatigue, and sensory changes. All of these symptoms can contribute to a fall or a tumble or difficulty with walking. And we want to be laser focused on identifying them and treating them as aggressively as possible. I also think that we have to be open to adaptations and to therapy. People with MS benefit from a tune-up. And I think that if you haven't done a course of neurophysical therapy or occupational therapy or speech therapy recently, you might benefit from considering it. I also think that we need to consider adaptive devices, a ankle foot orthosis, a cane, a walker, or a customized wheelchair can make all the difference between engaging in life and being trapped at home. This brings me to my next point, which is the need to paradigm shift. I'll link down in the description below a video I did on paradigm shifting. This is your ability to change how you think about something so you can achieve the alternate outcome. And I'll use an analogy. 
Imagine that you put your family in a motorboat and you motor out in the middle of a giant lake so big that you literally can't see the water's edge. And when you're out in the middle of the lake, the motor dies. So now you have a problem. You have to get your family back to shore, except you don't have a motor in the motorboat. So what do you do? Well, there's a lot of things that we could do. Maybe you collect all of everyone's shirts and you sew them together and you make a sail and you sail the boat in. Maybe you find oars and you row back in. Maybe you use your cell phone and call the Coast Guard. My point here is you got to get your family back to shore and you got to do it in a different manner. You have to paradigm shift. This is very relevant for the success of people living and surviving and thriving despite having MS. And it becomes very, very relevant when we enter into a secondary progressive phase. Whenever I meet with someone with progressive disease, I'm always very, very keen to screen for three things. These three things include difficulty with swallowing. The doctor term is dysphagia. It involves difficulty with urinary retention, which can cause urinary tract infections and actually damage kidneys, and bed sores or decubitus ulcers. I'll link down in the description below an entire video on this topic, and it's something that we need to be asking people about every single clinic visit, particularly folks that are in a secondary progressive disease state. The next topic to discuss is being four for four in your fight against secondary progressive MS. So being four for four are the four things that I'm aware of that can literally slow the disease down. And it's true in relapsing MS, and it's true in secondary progressive MS. So let's walk through it. Number one is to exercise as part of your lifestyle. Now exercising when you're 20 is different than exercising when you're 60. And exercising with early relapsing MS is very different than exercising with advanced secondary progressive MS, and yet it's still very relevant. And I want to highlight the benefits of neurophysical therapy, and I want to highlight the benefits of aquatic therapy. If you can't exercise the way you used to, it's worthwhile having a conversation with the physical therapist or with your provider to figure out new and exciting ways of remaining in shape. This is super, super important. Number two in being four for four is diet. We need to pay very close attention to diet. And as many of you know, I'm a firm believer that we need to drive the vitamin D level up. I'm a firm believer that we need to do a better job of drinking water. And I ask patients to avoid, avoid processed foods and high sugar foods. Most importantly, we need to adopt a heart healthy diet. A heart healthy diet will control cardiovascular risk factors. And as I mentioned earlier in the video, unchecked cardiovascular risk factors drive the disease faster. So there is good works to be done focusing on diet with secondary progressive MS. Number three is to not smoke tobacco. Smoking speeds up MS by almost 50%. And if you stop smoking, it slows it back down. So obviously not smoking is an important piece to being successful with an MS diagnosis. And number four is to take a disease modifying therapy. And as I've already shared in this video, it is my passionate belief that we need to not stop therapy just because someone reaches a certain age or a certain phase of their MS. I also think that the concept of de-escalation makes sense. And I would much rather consider de-escalating someone's therapy than stopping their therapy. I've done a video on de-escalation and you'll find a link down in the description below in case you'd like to hear more about that topic. Question of the day. Imagine that you're 55 years old, you haven't had an attack in five years, and you've been consistently taking your disease-modifying therapy. Your neurologist says, hey, maybe we can stop your medicine. What do you choose? Answer down in the comments section below. Yes, I'd be okay stopping the medicine, or no, I would not. I want to hear your response, and please share why. Thank you for learning about secondary progressive MS with me. If you'd like to learn more about progression, check out this playlist right there. YouTube thinks that you would adore this video right there. And if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, please consider doing so. Just click the circle right there. Until my next video or my next live stream, this is Aaron Boster saying take care.